The rise of Adolf Hitler to power was based on the ideology of an all-powerful, all-conquering master race. It followed that anything that undermined the health of the Aryan race had to be eradicated. It was not surprising then that it was German doctors who first discovered the link between smoking and cancer. For the Nazis, the abuse of tobacco fitted into a broader ideology of eugenics and racial purity. The Nazis had this view that your body belonged to the Fuhrer, your body belonged to the, to the nation. You were not supposed to abuse your body because you were really hurting state property uh, when you smoked or when you drank or when you used uh, drugs. And as a result, there was this view that anything you did that was hurting your body was, was hurting the state. Hitler's own health was fragile. He consumed an array of medicines and potions for his stomach, bowels and heart. But he was also a teetotaler and a vegetarian, a lifestyle he thought appropriate for the master race. You had the Aryan man, and they, they often looked like these Greek statues. They also wanted to eat right, you know, fiber and fruits and vegetables, everything we say these days about eating healthy. You had these movements in other countries as well, but it, it wasn't part of state ideology. And when you have a totalitarian, centralized government, it can become a part of state policy. The ideology of the master race demanded superfit young men and athletic girls. Propaganda films promoted healthy living and outdoor activities in the dramatic landscape of the fatherland. But a healthy nation also meant a broad assault on what German scientists of the time identified as threats to public health. I think of the Nazi uh, period as this quest for a, a sanitary utopia, an effort to clean up the air. They wanted clean water. They actually even wanted a healthy workplace. You find the first good studies on uh, the tobacco causation of cancer in the Nazi period, the first studies of asbestos causing lung cancer in the Nazi period, the first studies even of indoor radon uh, causing uh, lung cancer, and many other carcinogens are first identified in the Nazi period. So it was in Germany in the 1930s that the first serious and systematic attempt was made to establish a link between cancer and smoking. What you have in the Nazi period is uh, animal experiments that were large-scale, using many animals. You have the development of case control epidemiological methods, that is, methods where you would compare one population that smoked with a very carefully balanced similar population, same age, same race, same health condition, uh, who didn't smoke, and then you would see which had the higher uh, rate of lung cancer, and they found that there was a significantly higher lung cancer rate among the smoking population. Once the link had been established between cigarette smoking and cancer, it was clear that every effort had to be made to protect the master race from its effects. Safeguarding the purity of the stock was critical. Anything that might endanger the health of the Aryan child was forbidden. They thought that uh, especially German women by smoking were, would be reducing the fitness of their offspring this was uh, viewed as something that was an actually a crime against the, the German fruit of the womb, you might say, and that by smoking you were actually damaging the, the future of the, of the German race. Well, that certainly fit in with the eugenic policy um, that, you know, if, if you're going to breed a better man, um, you want them to be healthy. If smoking is bad for the organism and causes cancer, we don't want to perpetuate that in our race. Tobacco was attacked as an epidemic, a plague. Along with alcohol, it was a disease of liberal decadence. Smoking was discouraged in the armed forces and banned in Nazi party offices. By 1943, it was illegal for under 18-year-olds to smoke in public. And a year later, smoking was outlawed on city trains and buses. Hitler banned anyone from smoking in his presence, though he had been a smoker himself in his youth. He even attributed the success of the National Socialist Party to his decision to give it up. He credits the triumph of fascism to his giving up smoking. He apparently smoked until uh, around World War I, where he, 
He says he threw his cigarettes into the Danube and never looked back. And he says if he hadn't given up smoking, he wouldn't have been able to organize the Nazi movement in Germany. So this was something very, very close to his heart. What's more, on this issue, Hitler was convinced he had the edge over the Allied leaders. One of the interesting things about the politics of this time is that all three of the fascist leaders, Mussolini, Franco, and Hitler, were at, at least non-smoking, whereas all three of the Allied leaders, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin, were very heavy smokers. The American people, through their elected representatives in Congress, have determined to wage unremitting warfare against cancer. This, this is an American public information film made in 1940. It shows clearly that cancer was a public health issue. It gives advice about how to avoid the disease. Chronic irritation often influences the appearance of cancer. The chafing of a jagged tooth, the rubbing of the shoe... But it makes no mention of smoking being a cause of cancer. It wasn't until 1950 that Allied scientists caught up with their German counterparts, and much later, before positive action was taken to deter smoking. The discovery of the link between smoking and cancer was an example of good science being usurped by the Nazis for their own ends. It gave ample ammunition for Nazi propagandists spreading the ideology of the master race. And it was not long before Hitler's propaganda machine was exploiting a new technology that could spread the fascist message more effectively than ever before. Phones and cameras were used to photograph Hitler and record his voice so that all of Germany and others throughout the world could receive his message of hate and hypocrisy. The rise of the Nazi party in the early 1930s depended in part on terror, but also on the ruthless use of propaganda. Hitler's cold-blooded and calculating propaganda minister was Joseph Goebbels. He had masterminded the presentation of Hitler's anti-Semitic message using all available technology at his disposal. But soon there would be a new invention that could transform Goebbels' propaganda machine and make it even easier for the Fuhrer to be heard throughout the Fatherland. This new and revolutionary technology owed something to an obscure Austrian engineer living in Germany in the years after the First World War. His name was Fritz Fleumer. In 1920s Germany, Fleumer had the bright idea of coating paper with iron powder to make a cheap magnetic audio tape. This paper tape was fragile, but it would replace the existing expensive magnetic solid steel tape and could be edited with a pair of scissors rather than a soldering iron. Fleumer knew he was onto something. Fritz Flommer took his invention to Berlin, uh, to AEG, which was one of the leading electronics companies in those days, and they bought the patents and so on from Flommer and set up in 1932 a team to begin work on Das Magnetophone, the magnetic phonograph. AEG teamed up with the German chemical giant IG Farben to produce the world's first magnetic tape recorder. It would revolutionize sound recording. But when AEG demonstrated their new invention at the Berlin Radio Fair in 1935, it was not quite the sensation they hoped for. The radio engineers looked at this and said, Aha! This is it. Tape would be the ideal medium. We could record on it, we can snip it up, we can glue it or tape it back together and edit the shows to our heart's content. It would be a dream come true. One problem, the original AEG magnetophone shown at the 1935 radio fair sounded terrible. The fact was that the quality was good enough for speech for use as a dictation machine. After all, the Nazis used the early magnetophone to listen into and record telephone conversations. But its commercial potential, as AEG recognized, was extremely limited. 
they instantly saw that there would be no business based on dictation purposes only. They had to have the possibility and, and the technical means to recording music. That would make the business. In 1936, as the Nazis consolidated their power in Germany, the world-famous conductor, Sir Thomas Beecham, took his orchestra to Berlin and made this recording on the new equipment. It was a disaster. It sounds truly terrible. Uh, in fact, Sir Thomas was so horrified by the quality of what he thought was tape that he reputedly refused to use it until, I think, 1951. Then, just as war was breaking out in 1939, came an accidental discovery that changed utterly the prospects of the magnetophone. A German radio engineer, Walter Weber, stumbled on a signal processing method called AC bias that enabled the magnetophone to record high fidelity. Weber one day was experimenting with circuits, advanced circuits that would try to get this horrible noise and distortion to a minimum and make the, sound, the tape sound better, and he discovered quite by accident, AC bias, this oscillating a tone you would superimpose over your recorded information that would make that recorded information stand out. A second test was carried out on the new improved magnetophone. It was the revolutionary breakthrough that German technicians had been searching for. This was the introduction of the high frequency bias magnetophone to the public and it took place in a, in a huge Berlin cinema and people were amazed. That was the moment. That was the moment everybody recognized instantly that is the that's the best method for recording music and that will make a revolution. By the 1940s, as Germany launched its assault on the Soviet Union, the magnetophone became a must-have item for wealthy Germans. An American document at the time described how Hitler himself, at the height of the fighting, acquired his own machine. Hitler was first introduced to the magnetophone in his headquarters on the Russian front in 1942, and immediately he ordered a plane to bring additional symphony recordings from Berlin. So Hitler was photographed. The Nazi propaganda machine knew when it was on to a good thing, and exploited the new possibilities that the magnetophone offered. Hitler. 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 About six recordings of Adolf Hitler's speeches to, uh, during the World War. And Hitler didn't come to the studio, so the studio came to Adolf Hitler, and they used uh, tra transportable units of magnetophones to record these speeches. These recordings were edited and broadcasted to the public for propaganda means. Hitler sobbing, Hitler smiling, Hitler shouting, Hitler working his people into a frenzy. Hitler's propagandists discovered the magnetophone could be used to time shift the Fuhrer's speeches. With a sophisticated radio network inherited by the Nazis from the previous democratic regime, Hitler could record a speech on tape in one city for transmission in another. There were even suggestions that Hitler used the new technology to deceive his enemies as to where precisely he was. There's a persistent myth that still lives today that, uh, you know, um, uh, Hitler ordered the invention of the magnetophone tape recorder to fool the Allies as to his whereabouts. Well, that's nonsense. When high fidelity tape recording came along, yes, they recorded Hitler, yes, he was, his speeches were tape delayed and sent around. So of course, anybody in the Allied command listening to or monitoring German broadcasting would hear him pop up, well, gee, he's in, this is coming out of the Munich transmitter and all of a sudden we're getting a speech and he's making references, local references to Hamburg and, and, and now he's in Berlin. How are they doing this? Well. Uh, the, the same way they always did, clear back to the 1920s, with uh, an advanced, high-quality, live network with some sort of time-delay device, in this case, tape. As the war drew to a close, the plunder of Nazi science and secrets by the victorious Allies began. U.S. Army Signals Corps Major Jack Mullen and his team were given the task of rooting out new German electronics. 
Mullen had been intrigued by the quality of late-night wartime German broadcasts. I thought I was pretty familiar with what all types of recording were, uh, film and disc and... Uh, this sounded superb, and um, we thought probably Hitler must be having people work all night. Then, on a visit to a radio station a few weeks after the German surrender, Mullen heard an AC bias hi-fi magnetophone. I'd never heard anything like that in my life before. I couldn't hear any background noise. Very clean, no distortion that I was able to hear. Mullen copied the blueprints, shipped two surplus machines back to America, and in May 1946, went public with his Americanized tape recorders. It changed the course of the broadcast and music industries. It was a sensation. May 16, 1946 is a, a breakthrough date in American tape recording technology. Where the blue of the night. Bing Crosby was the first Hollywood star to use this new technology from Nazi Germany. Crosby found live radio a chore, and when he heard about the amazing new machines, he hired Mullen to record and edit his show for later broadcast. It was a first. The little piece of tape that I'm going to play on here was actually recorded in 1947, and it still sounds as good as it ever did. Where the blue of the night meets the gold of the day. The first show, Bing's rating shot back up. The switchboard at ABC, NBC was flooded with calls from LA residents. Why didn't you tell us Bing was going to be live? We would have all, we wanted tickets. So post-war, the magnetophone revolutionized sound recording. But for the Nazis, it was simply an existing technology they could exploit, a pattern for much of the science used by the Nazis. Indeed, some historians dismiss the traditional view of teams of researchers ruthlessly pursuing a Nazi science. It was often much more haphazard. And if you think of the popular image of the Nazi, you have the immaculately tailored officer and the, the, the professor in his crisp laboratory coat, and they're, they're dealing with the highest level of technology, and they have some maniacal plan. Now, the maniacal plan idea is absolutely correct, but the rest of it is totally false. In fact, one of the most important scientific inventions of the 20th century was developed by German scientists and the Nazi leadership didn't seem to care. This is the common view of science and technology under the Nazis. The mentally ill and the victims of the concentration camps were used as guinea pigs in medical experiments. These lives, in the view of Nazi ideology, were not worth living. They began to experiment on people, um, and they violated the Hippocratic Oath. They violated any kind of norm in medical science. Um, and uh, it, it's not surprising that that's what people associate with Nazi Germany. But the story of German technology during the Hitler years was more complicated than the common perception of evil scientists carrying out heinous experiments. Well, we tend to regard science in the Nazi period purely in terms of black and white as, as cruel experiments done by Mengele or other people on these concentration camp uh, prisoners, when in fact you have a massive scientific state that's developed that is pioneering uh, uh, medical techniques, that is pioneering rocketry and uh, optical techniques, techniques in industry, chemistry, uh, all aspects of, of science. So the period is much more complex and more rich and more interesting historically than the simple story of abuse of science uh, in the concentration camps. Hitler's fascist regime had come to power in Germany in 1933. The shocking reality was it happened in one of the most scientifically advanced countries in the world. At the time, Germany could boast half the world's Nobel Prize winners and the best part of the world's technological patents. Most Jewish scientists were removed from their posts. A substantial minority of the rest, more or less willingly, became members of the Nazi party. Many of the scientists who refused to join the party 
continued their research and were responsible for some of the most important inventions of the 20th century. But much of this research had its roots in democratic Germany before Hitler even came to power. There were a lot of technological discoveries in many different areas from quantum physics to um, biology. So there was a real flowering of, of science during the Weimar period. One of these inventions would revolutionize scientific research. Work on the electron microscope had begun in 1920s Germany and came to fruition in 1931. Science would never be the same again. You cannot think of modern science without computers. You can also not think of modern science without the electron microscope or certainly all the knowledge that has been collected with the electron microscope. The genius behind the discovery was Ernst Ruska, a young German electrical engineer based at Berlin's Technical College. His secretary, Lotte Lambert, worked closely with him to the end. Everybody liked to work with him and for him. He was very popular. He was regarded, everybody said he's the father of the electron microscope. His work was his life. He was what we would call today a workaholic. The dreadful irony was that as Germany was becoming the most murderous regime in history, Ruska had developed a machine that would uncover the secrets of life itself. The microscope had changed little in the years since it was discovered, but in the 20th century, it was no longer adequate. The power of an optical microscope is limited by the wavelengths of the light beams used to view a specimen. Since electrons have shorter wavelengths, they could magnify more. Ruska's genius was the discovery that a magnetic coil could act as a lens to focus an electron beam. Here on, on this PowerPoint presentation is a picture of the design of the first microscope that had more than one lens. And this design has as date uh, 9th of March 1931. And here you see these areas um, that are crossed through uh, here and here. Those are actual magnetic lenses. And his main invention, or one of the principal inventions, was to concentrate the magnetic field into a very narrow gap. And in that very narrow gap, one then has a very strong magnetic field, and uh, thus very strong lenses. And uh, that is what made uh, the high magnifications possible that, uh, that he, uh, he first achieved. This is what Ruska's electron microscope has become today a revolutionary and complex piece of engineering that can investigate the actual building blocks of life. The electron microscope was called uh, das Übermikroskop and uh, the, the super microscope the, the, uh, and it was a quantum jump. Suddenly you can look inside cells. You can see mitochondria, you can see uh, all kinds of little compartments in cells and the whole organization of life within the cell was largely explored by the uh, advent of, of the electron microscope. The Nazis, though, took no interest in Ruska's extraordinary discovery. There was, after all, no clear way in which the electron microscope could be used to promote Nazi militarism or propaganda or its racial policies. It was left to Ruska and his mentor, Max Knoll, to look elsewhere for funding and support. They could see the commercial potential of their invention. In 1930s Germany, though, they struggled to find an entrepreneur willing to finance their work. They trudged from pillar to post, they gave lectures, they tried to convince people in industry and in big firms who would take this, the risk to do that. It was difficult to, to convince them. They didn't believe that it would would be useful. In Nazi Germany, Ruska, a social liberal, waited six years before the industrial giant Siemens finally decided to fund his research. He worked in industry, uh, which is often seen as inner emigration. You weren't working at the university, um, teaching students, um, maybe having to inject ideology into your lectures. Uh, so the question is, would it have been better if he emigrated? Would science have been weakened even more if all these fine scientists had left? Despite the difficulties, 
Ruska stayed on in Germany to pursue his work on the electron microscope. Numerous Nobel Prize winners would owe their own discoveries to Ruska's invention. But it was not until 1986, just two years before his death, that Ruska himself gained the ultimate prize for his invention. This was the crown of his life, the Nobel Prize. He said it was a recognition for electron microscopy. He didn't think of him personally. He said, finally they recognized the whole field of electron microscopy, how important it was. He was happy for that. The electron microscope may have flourished despite, rather than because of the Nazis. Yet in the new possibilities it opened up for research into viruses and other diseases, it paralleled one important aspect of Nazi ideology. They would call Adolf Hitler the great doctor of the German people. They talked about enemies of the state being like a cancer, or the Jews being like a cancer. Uh, they talked about a bacillus uh, enemy uh, people. Uh, and so, uh, you both, I think, at the metaphorical level, the, the, the policy level, but also at this level of just uh, increasing the, the health of the German citizen in order to increase the health of the, the German state, medicine and, and public health was, was wrapped, uh, all of that together. This was all part of Hitler's propaganda war. But as the 1930s gave way to the 1940s, Hitler had to concentrate on the very real war he was fighting against the Allies. Hitler now needed to acquire new military hardware. To achieve that, German technological know-how would play a vital part. On September the 1st, 1939, the Nazi army smashed into Poland. The outbreak of war in 1939 radically changed the focus of German science and technology. The priority now was the development of new weapons that could give Germany the military edge. Wars tend to have a tremendous forcing function on technology. They tend to accelerate technology simply because a nation-state has no higher obligation than to survive in war. What the war does is it, it shifts priorities in the direction of pragmatism, the pragmatism of short-term uh, military goals. Almost everybody that wanted to try to do something was able to get money from, from the German government. If it was, let's say, guised in the context of a wonder weapon or a super breakthrough technology or something that could turn the tide of the war. Famously, the V-1 and V-2 flying bombs eventually became the super weapon that Hitler thought might win him the war. But in the early 1940s, both the Allies and Germany sought air superiority. And the key to this was ever faster planes. Both sides were trying to develop a fighter plane powered by a jet engine. But German engineers got there first. The man behind the new fighting machine was Ernst Heinkel. Ernst Heinkel was an individual who was really obsessed with speed. It seems to have been the great unifying driver in his technical life. Piston-driven planes were already flying in excess of 450 miles per hour virtually at the limit of propeller-powered flight. But Heinkel was determined to go one better and become the first with the jet engine. And he put together a team uh, under what he called Special Project 2, which was uh, kind of highly proprietary, and we would call it a compartmented program. They built a special part of the factory where they, only certain people could go in. And he actually assigned a team of engineers and technicians to make this come together. The first successful flight of Heinkel's prototype jet-powered plane, the HE-178, took place over a forest in northern Germany in August 1939. Heinkel believed the speed allowed by the jet engine would be a critical weapon against which enemy planes would have no defense. The jet engine was basically seen as a propulsion device that could enable an airplane to fly at very high speeds at high altitude. 
by flying at high altitude, you have much greater aerodynamic efficiency. In other words, the plane flies further for a given amount of fuel. And the jet engine could simply accomplish this in ways that a propeller aircraft could not. The jet simply gobbling air, mixing it with fuel, igniting it. Uh, the jet engine uh, was clearly a design element here that could give you the potential of the 500 mile an hour airplane or even beyond. It would be a high speed engine for high speed airplanes. A week after Heinkel's prototype was successfully tested, Hitler sent German troops into Poland and war was declared. On the ground, the German army swept all before it. In the air, the Luftwaffe was no less ruthless. Germany had built its military force around the concept of blitzkrieg or lightning war. And Hitler was so concerned with using the airplane as a tool of bombardment, as basically a bomber, that he was slow to come to the jet engine. The jet speed meant it could outfly any enemy plane either as close support for bomber attacks or in aerial combat as a lethal weapon against Allied bombers. But Hitler's aggressive military instincts meant he always favored the bomber over the jet fighter. He would soon pay the price. By early 1940, the German advance through Europe was at its height. The battle for air superiority over the English Channel became crucial. The Germans broke through the charge of hurricanes and spitfires that went out to meet them. 200 individual dogfights. The Battle of Britain started on July 10th and climaxed in mid-September. Despite early German success, the tide of the air war would then turn. The Battle of Britain was, in my view, the most significant battle to take place in Europe during the Second World War. And on September 15th, he sent the Luftwaffe into one of its greatest attacks. By losing that battle, Germany from that point on was clearly on a defensive against the Allies in the West. Britain became a huge, impregnable rock island aircraft carrier, if you will, from whence the Allies could mount a second front, an aerial second front, which they did very successfully. By the end of October, the Spitfire had triumphed. The Luftwaffe had lost 1,600 planes damaged or destroyed. And so we see then in the German air war, from that time on, there is this dramatic shift from offensive weaponry, which infuriates Hitler because he wants to build bombers and things to, to attack people, to having to build defensive systems simply to defend the skies of the Reich. Hitler turned to his scientists and engineers and belatedly to the jet fighter. He now knew that the hard-pressed Luftwaffe needed faster and more effective fighter planes. Heinkel's prototype 178 had been followed by the HE-280, which had made its first successful flight in the spring of 1941. Quite clearly, you see in the 280 the, the genesis of the modern jet fighter. It has space for armaments, space for sufficient fuel, a rugged structure capable of, of undertaking the role of a combat fighter. But only nine HE-280s were ever built. The problem for Heinkel was that he had a rival, the company run by Dr. Willi Messerschmitt. They had competed throughout the war to equip the Luftwaffe. More often than not, it was Messerschmitt who won out. Messerschmitt uh, succeeds, first of all, with the Messerschmitt 109, the aircraft that we will always associate with the Battle of Britain, for example, and the early days of the Blitzkrieg. And then later on in the jet aircraft business, he succeeds very much with the Messerschmitt 262. Messerschmitt had been developing his own jet fighter since 1939, but always seemed one step behind Heinkel. Then in late 1943, Messerschmitt got his break. Heinkel may have been first with the jet fighter, but Messerschmitt's 262 was superior, and Hitler approved the plane for mass production. There was an intense rivalry, but always Messerschmitt kind of came out ahead uh, in the fighter world. From the very beginning, it was clear that the MA-262 was a far better uh, aircraft. 
Because of its engine installation, it was much faster than the Heichel 280 also, and it had a much heavier armament. It was somewhat larger, a much longer range. So uh, based on all of those factors, the Heichel 280 was, was canceled. Arguably, three years had been wasted since Heinkel's 280 first took to the air. But in 1944, the Nazi High Command was confident that in the Messerschmitt, they had a plane that could dominate the skies. The big question was, had the best German engineers produced a machine that could win the war for Hitler? But the new obsession with speed brought its own problems. The old idea of jumping out of a plane with a parachute would no longer work in a stricken aircraft traveling at 500 miles per hour. To solve this, Hitler's engineers had to invent something new. In the past 50 years, it is calculated the ejection seat has saved the lives of more than 12,000 airmen. Since the end of the Second World War, all American air crew have been taught how to escape from their plane in an emergency. Oh, it's, it's so fast that you hardly know what it's, what's hit you, but, you know, it's a big kick in the butt. But once again, this life-saving equipment was first invented by technicians working in Hitler's Germany. As the Luftwaffe tried to regain control of the skies over Europe using the new generation of faster aircraft, it became clear that the increased speeds presented German pilots with new dangers. There's no question that as speeds got higher, uh, ejection seats were necessary. But uh, even before jet engines were fully implemented, uh, high-speed piston engine aircraft were also being fitted with ejection seats. The problem was how could a pilot escape from a disabled plane that was traveling in excess of 500 miles per hour? Jumping out with a parachute strapped on the back was no longer an option. If the pilot has to get out of that airplane, he is going to have a very difficult time indeed. One imagines him uh, jettisoning the canopy of the aircraft and then clambering out of the airplane and trying to throw himself over the side. The aerodynamic forces can pin him inside the airplane or they can carry him into other portions of aircraft structure. Now, you really do have to throw the pilot clear of the aircraft in some fashion. Ernst Heinkel and his team of engineers were already grappling with the problem. They thought, if he has to get out of the airplane, we better have some sort of catapult seat to throw him out. And this becomes, of course, the, as we say in the United States, the ejection seat. In a museum near Frankfurt, Germany, are the remains of one of the first ejection seats ever to be used in battle. This one was fitted to Heinkel's propeller-powered 219 Night Fighter. First of all, you have to trigger a handle to remove the canopy. Thereafter, um, a quick release mechanism releases the compressed air into the cannon, drives the piston upward, and this drives the whole seat out of the cockpit. This took approximately three seconds to activate the system. Luftwaffe pilot Otto Fries owes his life to this new equipment. Toward the end of the war, he was shot down at 8,000 feet over German territory. Blinded by blood in his eyes and with an engine on fire, he tried to pull the plane out of a dive. And then I thought, ah, can not be true. And then I thought to myself, it can't be true. This cannot be the end. There has to be a solution. I couldn't think straight. All I knew was I had to get out using the ejection seat. Then, by chance, I found my flashlight and I lit up everything and found here on this side a red flap. And in my excitement, I immediately pressed the red button. And instead of leaning my head here and the feet down, I was simply shot out. 
Dann habe ich also den falschen. I detached myself from the seat. Then I started tumbling. Und als ich dann überschlug mich, überkugelte mich und als ich dann. And as I dived through the clouds again, I thought it is now time to pull the parachute cord. And the parachute opened. Und hing also. And I started to descend. Schwebt also langsam. Without an ejection seat, I would have been lost. Also verloren gewesen, nicht? In total, it is thought that the ejection seat saved the lives of over 60 German pilots in the last years of the war. Vital at a time when experienced pilots were in short supply. But the technology that produced the jet engine and the ejection seat, which might have swung the war in Hitler's favor, came too late to save the Third Reich. For all its technical superiority, the Luftwaffe never mastered how to use the faster but less maneuverable jet fighter effectively. When we take a look at Messerschmitt 262s in combat, we find that there was a much higher loss rate than the Germans actually should have experienced. They had thought about the technology, but they had not thought about the doctrinal or operational tactics under which they, they would be using this airplane. More time might have helped the German high command, but it was the one thing Hitler did not have. From 1944 onwards, Germany was not a master of its airspace at all. And it is to try to offset that that we see this explosion of interest in Germany in building jet airplanes, building rocket-powered airplanes. Out of all of that, the only aircraft program that they can achieve in the short term that makes any sense at all is the Messerschmitt 262. But it simply came too late. By 1944, when the Allies landed on the beaches of Normandy, it was five years since Ernst Heinkel first successfully tested his prototype jet engine. Despite its superior technology, Germany was now in retreat. Its air bases had been bombarded, and the Luftwaffe was forced to conceal its new fighter aircraft in forests and operate flights from autobahns. They produced over 2,000. Uh, ME-262s, but they could only train a small number of pilots. So even with the best aircraft, uh, highly trained pilots make a vast difference. They're almost as important as the actual aircraft they're flying. We take a look at the history of aerodynamics in the 20th century and high-speed flight. Never did a country squander so great a technical advantage as Germany had. Had Hitler trusted the new technology and opted sooner for the jet fighter, the course of the war, if not its outcome, might have been different. That was the problem with the Nazi attitude toward technological research. Some science thrived, especially if it advanced the Nazis' ideological aims. But much of it was delayed, or in some cases, dismissed. Scientists, physicians, their professions were banned to them unless they supported the Nazi ideology. We're more familiar with the cases where the Nazis actually suppressed science. Uh, they launched an attack on what was called Deutsche Physik, or German physics, uh, and uh, supported what they called Aryan physics against Jewish physics. On the other hand, other aspects of science were actually promoted. So it divides according to whether the Nazi regime thought this was a threat to Germany or uh, was something that could be advanced to, to help the German race. Although the legacy of German technology is all around us, it was this narrow and distorted view that prevailed during the Hitler years. It meant that much of the genius of German science at the time went unrecognized by the Nazis, thriving despite, rather than because, of fascist ideology.